Hello everyone, welcome to the CEO Club. Today we have two very special guests, uh, Mr. Javed, who you will recognize, and we also have Aisha here. Welcome to the CEO Club. Thank you very much, thank you for having me back. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, you've brought uh, a business partner this time. Yeah, this is Aisha, I'll let her introduce herself. Yeah, thank you very much. So my name is Aisha and I am the face, I guess, uh, and the face and the one who runs the, the show in Clay Sky Healing. Um, and I think, I think when we partnered together, which was not too long ago for Clear Sky Healing, we decided to combine our services together so that Jav looks after all of the legalities and then I look after all of the, the messy work, the healing work, the trauma work to get women back to feeling good again within themselves post-divorce. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's your business. Uh, clear sky healing mm -hmm. and uh, your role is to help women after they've had the divorce usually it's after divorce i mean we've had women that come in where they're still married right um mm. they're not sure you know, what are my options what yeah. do i want to do sometimes they decide they want to go for the divorce sometimes they decide actually we're good right now and they carry on being you know in their in their relationship and it works out really well for them so most of the time post divorce yeah yeah and for people that haven't watched javed's podcast you want to do a little introduction to your business? Uh, yeah, so my name's Jared and I own and run Clear Sky Legal. Um, we specialize in all aspects of family law, which is divorce, matrimonial finances, Children Act, um, Islamic divorces as well, and non-molestation orders. Brilliant. So this the whole theme of this podcast is going to be about your services. I think the first question that a lot of people always ask is, why just women, uh, you know, all our... Uh, male uh, <laughs> listeners will always say, why you, Why just women? So I think we probably have to start with that. My, my own business, obviously, we is for everybody. Okay. The problem, that I'll tell you where Clear Sky Healing came from to a degree, was I was doing all the legal side of it. I, obviously, I run this law firm. We've got everything. The girls would come. We had majority of female clients. We'd sort out the legalities. They'd get divorced. Children Act would be sorted out, where the children are going to live, finances sorted out, who's going to keep the house and the car and the pension and the money. And then the girls would be left in limbo. Mm. Mentally and emotionally, they couldn't actually move on. Some of them suffered from trauma. Some of them suffered from loneliness. Some suffered from, I just don't know how to move on from here. Because I've been married for 15, 9 on 20 years. How do I suddenly just change my life? How do I suddenly go from being married to now getting on with my life as a single woman? And I saw that a lot, but there was nowhere to address it. And I think at the same time, I knew Aisha back then as well. I think we've known each other for a number of years now. And that's when I kind of got in touch with Aisha. And I said, it'd be an idea to set up something together that addressed this particular issue, whether it's through divorce, during divorce, or post-divorce. But these women need to be sort of taught to a degree or spoken to that they can get on with their life then. That they're actually not going to do anything stupid, not going to do anything daft, not go on a rebound. And uh, we used to get, we used to hear all sorts of horror stories. Um, so that was the sort of genesis of um, Clear Sky Healing. We like the horror stories. I think we'll get, we'll get into them later we'll on in the podcast. We'll get into the horror stories. Okay. <laughs> I've got some corkers for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so that's just to keep the listeners retained. If you're interested, uh, keep an eye out for the stories. So um, when you say, that the, uh, these women are unable to uh, sort of move on? Number one, they've never been in a position where they had to finance themselves in the marriage. They had to pay bills. They didn't have to worry about, you know, someone going out and um, bringing in the money because they never had to do that themselves. There were a lot of the women that we work with were homemakers. So they just focused on the children. So when it came to an actual divorce, they were left in a position where either they had no home or they didn't and they didn't know how to pay bills they didn't know how to manage their money they didn't know how to like apply for a job if they had to um that is the biggest one that we always come across is women not knowing because they just didn't have to do it in their marriage they didn't know the numbers they didn't know how much was needed to run the house they never had to worry about that so it makes it harder for women to be able to move on because they have to deal with first of all the heartbreak of divorce and almost all of the women that come to me are sad that they've gone through a divorce. They didn't want it. No matter how difficult their marriages were, they just never wanted a divorce. Like, they would rather stay and still be married if they, if they had that opportunity. They would still be in that marriage. 
And so they're dealing with the heartbreak, they're dealing with children potentially, and then they're also dealing with this other part of life, which is called what we call adulting, where they have to pay bills, they have to draw up like calculations of what it takes to run this house. And that's the hardest part, I think, where they're trying to grieve, be sad, but also be a parent and be a person that has to run the show at the same time. And it's just so many, too many plates turning for them, really. Yeah. That's, that's what I would say is the most difficult for them. New way of life is what they find difficult. Yeah. See, if you're married, there's a certain set structure. Everything's one. Traditionally, divorce means that everything's now scattered. So not only are you looking after your own emotions, now you've got kids who are now flitting between two different parents. If you've got someone who's going to effectively co-parent, which is sometimes rare, to be honest, you're not going to have that issue. But you might have an issue as a girl where your ex-partner is being an absolute X, Y, Z, where he's filling the kids' heads with all sorts of stuff. That, oh, this is all your mom's fault. Your mom doesn't want this and X, Y, Z, you know. Right, mom's now got to deal with that as well from the children, as well as trying to cope with their own emotion, as well as trying to run the house, and as well as trying to move forward and find, you know, forge her own path or forge her own sort of identity. She's got all these different things, which before they didn't exist. Yeah. And having to um, adult as well, yeah, like Aisha said, you know, you're going to have to start thinking about the bills now. You're going to have to start thinking about the community and not only that, there is that community element where all of a sudden you're labelled now. You're a divorcee. And that does not hang well with a lot of women within our society because there's a perception of divorced women. And that's one of my biggest bugbears is they're always treated like second-class citizens. We see them as second-class second citizens. We treat them like second-class citizens. Why? I don't know. I think specifically in the South Asian community. Yeah, oh, we, oh, well, that's what I mean. Within our community... Yeah. You will you will always have women who are divorced treated differently. Hundred yeah, percent. Sure. There's no way, you know, not I would I would say nine out of ten guys who are single, ten out of ten guys, they went home and they told their mom and dad who are of a certain um type, you know, Pakistani, yeah. the whole nine yards, right? First generation, second generation. They went home and said, Dad, I've met a girl, she's divorced, she's got two kids. And I want to marry her. There'd be a massive mindset difference yeah. to if he went home and said, Dad, I met a girl, she's single, never been married, and I want to marry her. Yeah. Even though there shouldn't be. Islamically, there shouldn't be. Legally, there isn't. Socially, there's that stigma. She's a divorcee. She's a divorcee. And we need to, as a society, get beyond that. But I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're ready. You think men have that same stigma, or is it just women? Women. Just women. Just women. See, a man can go out and do what he likes. Yeah? You know what I know. I'm going to say it because it's there. Right? A man can go out and have 20 girlfriends. Yeah. He's a stud. He's the man. <laughs> I had 20 birds, yeah. man. He's smashing yeah. it. A girl goes out, has 20 boyfriends, known that she's been with 20 guys. She's also an S, but it ain't a stud. And it <laughs> begins with S. And it ends with G. <laughs> am I right? Am I wrong? Yeah. That's the perception, isn't it? Right? Yeah. That's the disparity we're dealing with. Right? And I'm not saying either party is right. I'm not saying a guy should go out and do that. And I'm not saying a woman should go out and do that. I'm talking about perception, how we as a society perceive it. That is the way it is. So a guy can be divorced. He can get married again tomorrow like that. Yeah. A girl's divorced. It's going to be more difficult. And then what happens is if you follow the train track, when a girl's divorced, she's more open to being forced into a mistake or cornered into a mistake. Well, her parents might just be like, you know what, just marry him. Like, so we've got a rich star come through. You're a divorcee. You might, never f you might not ever find anybody again. Just do it. And then what ends up happening? You're going back into the same thing again now, where you haven't actually thought properly about the second marriage, and chances are the outcome is going to be the same. That's the, that's the sad thing. Changing the perception then, when you meet up with these women or you say if you're looking at somebody getting judged, how will you change that perception? Well, the purpose being judged or the person judging them? Both. The person judging them needs educating and they need, all, I need, they need, a, they need a full holistic education, both in terms of s telling them or they need to know that we don't live in 1948 in India, Pakistan anymore. This 2024, Islamically, there is no distinction between a divorcee and a single person. This is a cultural phenomenon. We've created this culturally because we, like we like to have a 
a daughter-in-law or a wife who is pure, who is, you know, she's like that. We don't want an off-caste. Someone else is second. That's a cultural perception. It's not an Islamic perception. Islamically, our Prophet Sallallahu married many divorcees. And this is well known. Many divorcees. You know, even as a completely single man, his first wife was a divorced woman. So this is what I'm saying. Now, I defy any man in this day and age to openly say to me that he, as a 25-year-old, mm. would go home and tell his mom and dad, I'm going to marry, depending on which hadiths and which narrations you believe, I'm going to go and I'm going to marry a 43 to 45-year-old divorced woman, which I think is his first wife was 15 to 20 years older than him, depending on certain narrations and certain yeah. hadiths. In this day and age, a 25-year-old guy going home saying, Dad, I'm marrying a woman who's 40, 41, and she's a divorcee. How would that parent react? Now, that parent needs educating to say, okay, it happened, it happened to the best of creation. He did it. Who am I to do? But no, because cultural stigma is that, you know, what are people going to say? What is your anti shagufta going to say? What is your anti busher going to say? Even though yeah. there's anti bushers and anti shagufters have got enough crap going on in their own house, but they have to interfere in everybody else's house. That's always, yeah, what, what That's people always say. the case, isn't it? Well, we always find that even those anti shagufters and, and bushers. They've gone through a divorce themselves as well. Yeah. And they've gotten married as well. And, you know, I see this all the time. Like, women have gone through difficult marriages, um, abusive marriages, or divorces, or they've been widowed, but they still have that animosity towards other women that but decided that's the, that's to the level get of education. Divorced. See, that's where they need educating, they need help, they need, you know, I don't know, professional therapy, I suppose, to actually, actually what is going on with you? Why are you like this? <laughs> and, and the person judging them, that's them. The person being judged, they need to be told. So that, that girl being judged needs to be told, you know what, there's nothing wrong. You've not done anything illegal. You've not done anything haram. You've not done anything that is out of the ordinary. All you've done is you've defied a culture that we think, I personally think, there's certain elements of that culture that is still backwards, that is still regressive, that still holds women back. They still have labels which are meaningless. You know, we still have perception, but that's still filtering generationally into the new generation. That needs to be broken. Once that's broken, you will see these women who are at this moment in time marginalized in society come to the forefront. And they've got so much to offer. They've got so much to give. They've got so much that they can contribute. And not just that, if you just leave them, uh, A, alone, and B, if you actually help them, it'll help their life. They'll be bringing up much better children. They can you know, contribute to them their own household. They can be self-sufficient instead of just constantly hammering them. Yeah. It's just not worth it. What gives you the qualifications or the rights to be given that kind of advice? What's your background? Um, so in my very short, humble years in this earth, um, I went through a divorce myself, first of all. Um, so we left, um, our, we as in me and my daughter, left a marital home when I was 20, 22. I think I was 22. Oh. When my did girl, you get married? 17. 17, okay. Yeah, wow. so very, very young. Very young. Um, I was 22 and my girl was, I think she just turned three. So right. something that's very, very young. Um, and we went to, we, we went to, the only option I had at that time was to go and move to a women's refuge. And, um, we were there for about 10 weeks, I think. And, um, alhamdulillah, we were given a, a house. There were women there that had been living there for over two years. So the maximum requirement the maximum length of time you can stay there is two years. But, you know, if you don't have a house, where are you going to go? And there were all types of women there, um, women that had gone through severe, severe physical abuse, um, mental abuse, all sorts of cr just crazy, crazy cases. And I was the only one at that time that could speak fluent English, right? A lot of people didn't. It was a lot of um, Desi women there. And... I have pretty broken Punjabi and Urdu, but we had to. Tr I had to translate like some of the things that they said um, into like their f with their forms and things. So when their support workers went there, I would translate what they said, what they needed me to translate, put them into their forms, all of that stuff. Um, and I remember one particular woman. She came in maybe a week before I, I was going to leave. She came from the hospital. She'd just given birth. She'd just given birth and uh, she came from the hospital and uh, normally you're not told, you're not told that uh, a, a new woman is coming, 
but this time we were we were told that a new woman's coming she's already got two small children but she's got a newborn baby and um we all women took it in turns to hold the baby feed the baby change the baby brand new baby she goes my house was it was too volatile she couldn't go back so she was taken straight from the hospital to bring her to that refuge and i remember a few days later it was i was put in charge of showing her like where the shop was where the bank was where the bus stop is because she wasn't from bradford and um i remember walking towards it was a tesco walking towards the shop and i'm telling her okay this is where the doctors is etc etc and she said to me she goes asha you speak english very well i said yeah i was born i was born here born and bred here in the uk and she said so if you were born here why are you here i didn't understand in that first second but then it hit me and she thought if you didn't know english you were not educated here obviously you're going to end up in in a marriage like that and i remember just crying because it made me so emotional to think that just because you don't know the language just because you're not educated here it doesn't mean that you can't end up in a position like that and i think that's part of the stigma in divorces as well they seem to think that it's always the uneducated people that go through divorce well in fact we have clients that are doctors that are lawyers that are dentists that are lecturers they're fully and highly educated abuse is everywhere and anywhere you know you don't have to be a woman you don't have to be a man um in in the marriage it happens on both sides so when i i remember the day that i left you have to pack up all your things and give some of the things back that they allow you to use and i remember looking at the doors and the walls and the paint and thinking one day i want to come back and i want to be able to help women in this position in whatever capacity that is and so over the years what i went to do first of all i started working on myself but that took a bit of time it took about 2 years for me to figure out that i should actually you're responsible for yourself nobody's going to come and save you and if they, even if they try you have to be able to say hey i'm willing to to get that help receive that help and you have to take responsibility in your life if you want to get anywhere any type of success you have to take that responsibility and i had to take that responsibility and say to myself like okay i said this has happened in your life what do you want to do to get to go forward and so i buckled down into studying because i'm i've always been a bit of a nerd yeah, right and um i never used to be proud of that but now i am <laughs> i'm proud of that um so i went into um looking at how to first of all help myself so i went through coaching i went to therapy i went to counseling um and did different modalities of like help then decided to get into something myself so i remember um first starting studying something called nlp so neuro linguistic programming okay. um and that was firstly i started off with it just for myself how can i challenge my thoughts because we can get some really intrusive thoughts in this in this world i'm telling you you know you're not good enough you can't do this how are you going to do this you know you're too busy thinking about tomorrow instead of thinking about today so i started off doing it for myself and then i realized hey I can do this because I was doing digital marketing at the time and I came across a woman who was life coaching so it just just came across this woman that was life coaching and I started asking her questions as well hey how did you get into this she talked about NLP she talked about um qualifying going to uni doing uh, psychology and so all I did was progress into different different uh qualifications so i did cbt in therapy my favorite subject that i actually really like to study is islamic psychology and i've just progressed from there to be able to teach it um study with people um and study the subject with people and it's just been so refreshing to be able to combine like islam and psychology together but i think a lot of people don't realize actually there's a lot of psychology in islam anyway and one of the reasons we decided to you know bring in the islamic element to it is number one i was already doing it but number two a lot of women come to us because they're conflicted on what to do so i a scenario may be is my parents are really difficult and they're telling me to stay in this position 
and the their position is their ex in laws or the uh, husband the in laws and the husband excuse me are being extremely abusive. They want to leave, but the parents are saying, no, you can't leave. Okay. Because it's going to bring so much shame on me. Mm. So they want that Islamic pers- uh, perspective, like, Asha, what do we do in this position where I don't want to disrespect my parents, but I also can't stay in this position as well because I, I don't have enough freedom. And for freedom, it's basic rights I'm talking about here. Not being able to go even to the shops. We have women that haven't been able to even go to the shops to pick up a gallon of milk or not being able to study or work or whatever it is. Um, and those types of scenarios is when people really want that Islamic perspective because they come to us and say, look, throughout all of these difficulties, like I feel like my iman, my faith in God is just diminishing. And the saddest case I had was a woman who said to me, I don't know if I want to be Muslim anymore. And, and that case is the only the only case that's ever made me cry like after I spoke to her because she said I don't know if I want to be Muslim anymore because of the way people have treated me and even if I stayed Muslim I don't know if I ever want to be married to a Muslim man because the the guy that she was married to was an alim he was a scholar and she said yeah but if you're if you're in a scholar a scholarly person and you're supposed to know all these great things about Islam, how can you treat woman, a woman like that? And that just broke me when she said that to me. Like, I don't know if I want to be Muslim anymore. Is there a God? So we're dealing with like philosophical things like that all the time, every day, of whether people want to keep their religion in Islam. Well, belief then doesn't exist the same. So <coughs> it will always, like, one thing leads to another. Mm. So when you're questioning your own marriage... And whether to leave or whether to get out of the marriage, you're then going to question the basis of the marriage. You're then going to question what my religion says. And then if you don't get the correct answers or you get an incorrect perception, perspective, you're going to then question why the religion says that. And then you're going to question your own culture. Then you're going to question your parents. So you get a lot of women who do basically, I wouldn't say rebel, but because of their incessant questioning of everything, they're looking for an answer that sometimes the answer isn't, out there it's actually within yeah so you're kind of going try not to project outwards have a look inside and then from the inside you use what you already know with regards to religion you've been looking at religion like this why do you look at it like that instead does that make sense you've yeah. been looking at the harsh parts of it or you've been looking at what you perceive or what people have told you oh no no divorce is bad divorce says this you know islam says this about divorce and the woman is going to get cursed and well actually but islam also says that a woman has the right to do xyz a woman has the right to you know, property, she has the right to, you know, look after herself, she has the right to do X, she has the right to do Y, she has certain rights over her husband, if them rights are not met, then she has a case for divorce, she has a case to basically turn around and say, well, actually, I don't want to be with this marriage, so a lot of it is, it's there, it's putting it in the right places, and putting, and showing them the right perspective, the problem is, is because, again, our culture demands that you stay within that marriage, we're going to take from religion and from Islam, whatever we want, that's going to suit that particular narrative, yeah, Right, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use our elders and the Malanas and the Mulvis and the and our elder elder communities to basically convince a generation of women why you shouldn't do this thing, why you shouldn't do this thing. Am I making sense? And we we had that in our generation when I was growing up. All the girls were taught. You probably your mom, or you, they were taught that if you if you if you take your headscarf off, the devil's going to pee on your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody's heard that, right? Yeah. There's no authentic hadith for that. There's no. It's not in the Quran anywhere. It's a cultural thing, but it seeped so far deep yeah. that that's everybody kind of like that's become a normative thing now. It's a normal that that story or that little anecdote is completely normal. You used to say the same about the Moscow. If you take your Moscow, Moscow <laughs> yeah. yeah, something's gonna happen. You know, yeah. you got the shoe thing. Everybody got the shoe thing, right? Shoes upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, something's you know whatever. These are all cultural little things that don't mean anything, but. They might be funny in isolation, but when you bring them together and put it into a concept or in the arena of marriage and divorce, they go a long way. It's preventing women from doing things. It's preventing people from doing things. It's preventing sometimes the men who want to sort the marriage out from doing things. I know a lot of guys who say, I don't want my marriage to break up. I can't leave my parents. I don't want my my wife to leave me. I don't want to lose my child. But my mum is saying this or my dad is saying this. And I'm, you know, I I don't know know which side to move on. Mum... 
go. What's the important thing to you? You know, you know what, go to where your religion says you have to treat everybody equally. If you couldn't do justice to that woman, you shouldn't have married her. Yeah. You shouldn't have you shouldn't have taken on such a big responsibility. These things are the ones that you should have been taught and should have seen beforehand. I'm gonna make sense. Don't yes. don't ruin people's lives over over a whim. I, I had a girl who came to see me, um, like we were saying about divorced women and how they're seen as both sides of the fence, whether it's sometimes their parents, society, um, people trying to get married to them again, they're seen as easy fodder. They're, they're divorced, right? Yeah. They're not, they, they're just seen as easy. And now I had a girl come and see me and she literally, she went to an event on Saturday, met a guy at the event. I like you, you like me. Let's start chit-chatting. Spoke to him Sunday, spoke to him Monday during the day. Monday evening, he turns up at her door with his mom. We want to marry your daughter. Daughter's divorced. She's got, I think, two kids, three kids, whatever it is. Her parents went, thank God somebody's taking her. Yeah. And that's literally what it is. Thank God somebody's taking her. Like she's no longer with us. Tuesday, she had in the garden. From Saturday of meeting him at this event to Tuesday, she's had a Nick garden. She lives with him, X, Y, Z. Within a month, she finds out that he's already married with six kids. He's already got a wife with six children. No and he just went to this event as a bit of a gas, you know, what the hell. Let's see, because it was a divorcee only event. So he went and thought, let me try my luck. And she found out. And even then, the community at large and her parents said, don't go for the divorce. What does it matter? What does it matter? It's fine. You'll, you know, you've got somebody there to look after you. You've got somebody who's going to, you know, do things for you, you know, help you out financially, etc. But that's the perception and that's the image we have. And that's when I say, you know, they treat like second class citizens. And that's our, that's a community. That's our failings. That's our failings. We're not educated enough Islamically, socially. We're just not a sort of mature enough to deal with them with justice. And I've seen girls who are divorced do crazy things, absolutely crazy things, because of the fact that, they just, I don't know, you know, they, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know where to get the help from. They don't, you know, society shunning them. Their parents are shunning them. Everybody's just kind of pushing them away. They, they, and they end up doing very extreme, stupid things. You just mentioned there that you were divorced at, uh, at 22. Are you able to talk a little bit about your experience and uh, what you went through and how it affected you? Yeah, we moved out at 22. We didn't get divorced at 22 okay. yet. But I was actually pressured to sign those divorce papers very quickly and I didn't want to do it straight away. Um, so when I moved to the, the women's refuge, uh, you're all assigned a sp support worker. I have no qualms in telling you that mine was terrible. Like, she was hardly ever there. She was always ill. Um, and I didn't have anyone to speak to a lot of the time. And but I remember her sitting across me saying, you need to sign those papers because you need to do it for your daughter. And I remember saying to her, number one, I don't know if I want to get divorced. Don't pressure me. It's only been a few weeks since I've been here. Number two, I really want to see if we can work this out. And I think separation is, is healthy. Right. I go we're, we're on amicable terms. We're speaking to each other and I want to see where it goes. I remember her making me feel incredibly guilty. And I thank God I didn't sign any papers at that time. Because honestly, I would have regretted it at that time. Really regretted it. But the guilt that she put on to me, which I recognised at that time, but now recognise how much and how thick it was on me, was just, was just crazy. So why was she doing that? What's the benefit of her doing that? I think what they're trying to put into women is... Because a lot of women still didn't realise they were being abused. Right. right? And w we're not talking about small level stuff there. When it comes to that level, there's women that have been thrown out on the streets, women that were like, you know, physically hurt, left, abandoned, all sorts. Like, it's really gruesome to even mention. So we're talking about high level abuse here. And they still don't get that they're being abused. Right? And so some of them had social workers involved. 
where they have to take the the woman and the child away from the individual or the family that they're living in and so the pressure that she's trying to put on a person is to make them understand that this if you stay you're only going to do bad to yourself and so get get a divorce it's going to be easier you're going to live life you can do whatever you want now I understand where she was coming from but that's not the way you do it and now as a professional in that I think that was not the way you speak to someone who doesn't know what their options are give a person the option and let them make the decision because even a lot of people think that we tell people to go and go through a divorce Mm -hmm which I have never, ever done and I never will do because I might be able to see if I see everything from a very different lens than the other person. They don't even know sometimes they're in that position. So you have to be able to get them to the place where they make a decision that's good for them. And if they choose to stay, then you have to support them. But you also have to ask them, okay, it was your marriage was difficult before. What can you do now to make it better then? If you're choosing to stay, what's the plan going forward? So if you're choosing to stay, there has to be a plan. If you're choosing to leave, there also needs to have you need to have a plan as well. So what are the options? Because you need the woman to know that she has all the options in the world and it's her right. But you also need her to know that there's a plan going forward so they're not as scared, whatever that plan is and whatever decision they make. But yeah, there's a lot of pressure in women's refuges. Um, I think unfortunately some of them, because they don't know English that well as well and they don't know the system, they're pressured into into giving that because some of the women there had um, like visa situations and citizenship situations as well. So that plays a big uh, part into what they do and what they decide to do as well. I think there's avenues open as well. This is a problem. There's mm. not that many avenues open to South Asian women who want to get divorced and move on with their life. Yeah. The, the, the help, the support sometimes just isn't there. Okay. Simple as that. You, you know, like I said, they're just too often left to fend for themselves. And then that creates a bitterness, that creates um, a bit of anger, resentment in them towards the community. And like I said, in you know, certain cases, even towards the religion, they've got, because they think, I'm, you know, I'm part of this whole rigmarole, I'm stuck here. And then that then filters down into the children as well. And that's where, that's where I think Clear Sky Healing comes in a lot of the times where we have said to, you know, we've got WhatsApp groups set up and we've got uh, Zoom sessions, the multitude of programs that we're running all for different different types of therapy, I guess, yeah. for want of a better word, in terms of what is it that you need? Where are you at the moment? So, you know, Aisha will usually speak to these girls. Some of them will actually turn around and will say, you're not ready. Like we're speaking to one girl at the moment. Yeah. She's very young, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think, what, is she 18? Very young. She's about something eight, like that. Something like that. She's about 18, 19. 19. And, um, and she's just not ready for it. But so we're just, you know, she got in touch with us. So we spoke to her. I should spoke to her. And I said, she's not ready for to get onto a program yet because she's still resisting it. She's still like, she knows her marriage is over, but she's like, I don't know. I don't know. What about this? But what about this? And what, you know, there's still a, that multitude of excuses. Now, when they're ready and they're fully on board, it's going to benefit them that much more. See, once you, once you know that, hang on a minute, I, I can address these issues in my head. I can address these issues with somebody else. Then you're more open to actually, okay, then help me. I, I want that help. Whereas a lot of girls, we know they need help, but they haven't acknowledged it themselves yet. Mm. And until they don't acknowledge it, they're not going to take part in it properly, fully. And I think that's where a lot of the sort of assessment or the analysis, I think, from Aisha comes in, where she can turn around and say, well, hang on a minute, you're ripe, you're ready and you need it, and I know exactly the outcome. A lot of the time, it's laying down the train tracks. Which part of life are you suffering with? Which part of the whole divorce element are you, not at a times, ex-husband triggering me. I'm married to a narc. Yeah. Right, we get a lot of that. A lot. Yeah, ex-husband's a narc. He's triggering me. Every time, boom, he'll say something, I get triggered. He says this, I get triggered. He'll say something to the kids deliberately to get through to me, I get triggered. And it's he's showing them and teaching them coping mechanisms of how not to and i used to do it a lot when uh before clay sky healing i used to just do it myself in terms of you know when kids are having contact with their dad and the wife would ring and say oh, the kids are back but boom, 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 this has happened and you kind of like speak to them and say listen no 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 no. let's look at the bigger picture let's look at this let's look at this concentrate on this part here don't worry about that but with clay sky healing you're actually giving them the tools to cope with that to actually say use this strategy and it'll work and it does work 
And yeah. girls are now like, hang on a minute, whatever he says, whatever he does, I don't get triggered. I try, you know, I try my hardest not to get triggered because I've got that weaponry. I've got that armory that you guys have given me that you've taught me. And that's that was one of the main motivating factors is just to get girls from A to B. Yeah. To say just because you're divorced and just because all this has happened doesn't mean that you can't have a a really fulfill fulfilling life. yeah a meaningful fulfilling life away from all the community crap. You know that's going to be that's inevitably going to be there in the background. Unfortunately, it's, you know it's a really funny story. I've got um, a very close friend and she's divorced. She got married again, and the husband, her husband. He's a divorcee as well. And uh, we were talking once before and she said, what's really funny? She goes, every time me and her, me and him argue, after a certain point in the argument, we kind of look at each other to say, well, hang on a minute. You've already been divorced. Mm. <laughs> I've already been divorced. Yeah, let's not, let's go, not there. go there again. Let's not go there again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that level of understanding is increased a little bit. But by the same token, and I've seen this, by the same token, I know guys who get married to a divorcee, and they will openly say it, and I've heard this many times, that mm -hmm. a divorcee will, will, she will take more crap yeah. than a single girl because she's been divorced before and she's too scared to get divorced again. Therefore, what they'll do is they'll push out the boat a little bit further. Yeah. A little, because they know she doesn't want to get divorced again. Yeah, yeah. You know? that she'll do anything. She'll do anything to keep, to keep this marriage. marriage intact. Yeah. Simply because she doesn't want to be labelled as that woman who got twice divorced. Because then she looks like the problem. Right, then yeah. she looks like the problem. Yeah. You know, again, it's that social thing. I know guys have been married for, for I've personally got a relative um, who's on his fifth wife. Or is it fourth or fifth? Married, beheaded, died. Married. No, I mean, <laughs> literally, he's on his like fourth, fifth wife. Nobody bats an eyelid. No. Like, literally, my mum will turn around and say, oh, so and so. Yeah, he got married again. All right, he's on his fifth wife or whatever and I'm like yeah. oh that's really I've good got, I didn't I've got men in my family that have gone through like sometimes my mum has to say oh oh yeah that wife and that, that wife, wife that I'm wife. like oh other way around that's all it's a different she's story. twice divorced there's something wrong with her yeah yeah what do you feel like are the uh factors that are contributing towards increased divorces then in this society because I feel like people give up on marriages a lot faster than uh, maybe previous generations like there's there's an increased level of uh, marriages breaking down I would say majority of the time, from my from the legal perspective, from what I do at Clay Sky Legal, majority of the time is um, it's unrealistic expectations. Okay. It's immaturity, unrealistic expectations, and the fact that now the world and society is a much smaller place. So that's those are literally the most. We have Instagram, we have TikTok, we have Snapchat. All these social media platforms are geared for one thing and one thing only, to show people how amazing we are and how yeah. brilliant we are. And it's a filtered, literally, because they've got filters on there now, it's literally a filtered world. Yeah. There's no semblance of reality. There's no semblance of realness anymore. Everything's like, oh my God, look at him. Look at her. Isn't he like this? So what we've done is we've taken that digital social media world, which is full of fakery and full of filters, and what we've tried to do is somehow pick that up and bring it into the real world and think when we live our life and when we're married, it's going to be like this. It's going to be this amazing, bright, neon, lit, beautifully, covered, amazing. It's not. Real life isn't like that. So when you have unrealistic expectations of a relationship, of a marriage, inevitably it's going to break down. That's the, I would say that's the first thing. Second thing, there's no, there's no sort of um, patience left. Yeah. There's no working on things. And I'm not talking about sabr the way us Pakistanis use it. See, for us, when we say it, as a South Asian community, when they say sabr, what they mean is, listen, let him kick the seven shades of crap out of you. You stay there. Mm. We're not talking about that sabr. That's, that's not sabr. Yeah, sabr is basically having the fortitude. It's to kind of say, listen, I'm going to plow through this, what, what is here. I'm going to... I'm going to plow through it. I'm going to wait for a bit. Not that I'm going to keep getting abused. We don't have sabr anymore. You don't think, hang on a minute, this marriage is not working. Let's just give it a little bit of time. What if we tweak this, change this, maybe do this, maybe do that? You know, I take a step back. He take. Now, break up on Monday, divorce on Tuesday, remarry on Wednesday. Mm. You know, that's how quick society moves. The other thing we've got now is nobody communicates anymore. Nobody talks anymore. Nobody actually does anything anymore. Everything's on the phone. Everything's on social media. Everything's about basically you know it's all you know bells and whistles now and that those are the those are i would say the main contributing factors and and 
one of the biggest problems is is everybody wants something you know girls like you speak to a girl and the, and i i've got a couple of friends who are relatively young and they're all majority of them are very level-headed but you might speak to the odd one and two or one of their friends what are you looking for in a man it's got to be minimum six foot one and he's got to be minimum a degree level and he's got to be minimum on 50 grand a year and he's got to have minimum and i'm going everything you've just said and drive a porsche yeah, yeah. I, oh yeah 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 and he's <laughs> got to have a minimum a beamer yeah. minimum but if you know if he drives like a porsche aventi laventi Macani, whatever whatever yeah. these cars are right <laughs> it'd be awesome and i'm like looking at her thinking in all your little shopping list not once have you mentioned anything about character yeah not once have you mentioned mentioned anything about nice he has to be a nice guy yeah you've not mentioned his character his demeanor his behavior, his attitude towards life, his perception and his thinking on Islam, what he feels about family, what he feels about children. All you've said is has to be minimum six foot one. Yeah. So I'm looking at it thinking, so if you met a really nice guy and he was amazing, but he happened to be six foot and a half inch, he's out of the door then, isn't he? See, we're too quick now to look at someone and go, boom, you know, swipe left. Just We've become instantly. a swipe left society. So I look at someone and go, nah, next, nah, no, 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 I don't like his beard, no, I don't like the lines, he's, uh, right now, I don't like it, boom. We're not into character anymore. We're not into actually sitting down, talking to people, sitting down and actually going, okay, what do I really value in life? Values have become a little bit, yeah. What is it that you actually value? When you get married, you and your partner are going to have to walk together throughout life. That's going to have its ups, it's going to have its downs, it's going to have its straight path. You're not going to stay young and beautiful forever. Trust me, am I making sense? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, what is that going? What's going to keep you going? It's going to be character and values. Whatever values you share with each other is what's going to keep you going. If you base your marriage and your life on materialistic things, they're going to dissipate. They're going to go away. You're not going to have the same car forever. So, what does that mean? So, this girl, wherever she is, and saying, "Well, he's got to drive minimum BMW." So, the day he loses that BMW, and it might be the nicest guy in the world, and he goes in a bloody Fiat Five Hundred. She's just going to walk out on him. Yeah, that's true. That's where we've got to now as a society. We've become almost superficial. And I think, personally, we need to go that way. We need to go backwards. You know, people say, oh, no, no, I'll, you know, I'm 2024. 20, Let's go backwards. Let's go back to where there was Dean. And we used to look at character. We used to look at behavior. We used to look at the uh, sort of, you know, uh, the salah of somebody and kind of go okay this person is dini as we call him you know he's a dini person he's a dunyadar person he knows rather than going oh bro you know um, nice whip apparently that's what they call it now yeah. don't they a right, nice whip <laughs> it's bonkers absolutely bonkers and that, these, these are the contributing factors towards where we are where we are I want to take it a step further and we wow. can be a bit controversial here yeah I I personally think also um Toxic uh, feminism as well plays a massive role in today's generation. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm all for women having rights, right? I think, fine, you know, you have a, your own bank account, you go to work, you know, you can vote if you do vote. That's fine. But I think what's also happening is because the, ra the rise of women, so we're getting more women are getting into higher positions, they're earning more money, they can now drive cars themselves. I think men find it hard sometimes to match that because now women are thinking, what do I need a man for? I can earn myself now. I can drive my own car. I have my own bank account. And the 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 hard part of that is, is I think fem some parts of feminism has really become really toxic in terms of now women, especially in the Muslim community, are thinking, well, I don't need a man anyway. So well, I don't agree with that. Though. Why? I don't agree with that because I know a lot of girls who are in their late 20s, early, early 30s, high achievers. I don't think that, personally I'm saying, that's not what they're thinking. That's the perception of the male gaze, right? So if I'm a bloke in my early 30s, I'm looking at that girl who might be a lawyer, she might be really well-to-do, she might have everything. I'm suddenly scared now that, hang on a minute, I can't A, match that, B, social decorum social thinking has already told me that a man needs to be here and a woman needs to be here now that woman there is never going to be down here she's either going to be my equal or she's going to be above me but that is about perception i don't i my personal opinion is i don't necessarily think it's about the female um toxic nature it's the way we've then created these 
these images and these basic standards. See, I get a lot. I get. I know a lot of girls who are in the late twenties, early thirties, in within my industry, who are amazing, absolutely amazing. They can't find a husband. They can't find a husband. Simple as that. And the reason is a lot of guys are just intimidated. They're completely intimidated because they think, hang on a minute. I'm not sure I can handle a girl like that. I've got a very, very close friend. She didn't get married until she was 37. And she's counsel, so she's like a barrister. And she's she's brilliant. Absolutely one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet. You know, really down to earth, really nice. They need everything. But I know guys meet her and go, no, you know. But that's what I'm saying. No, but what, how is that the female's fault is what I'm saying? Because I think... The, there's uh, two there's yeah. two aspects here. Yeah, that is. One is what you're saying from yeah. the male perspective. And he I looks at that. this woman and think, oh my God, she's she's earning more than me, etc. Yeah. Yes. That's one. That's yeah. one. The other point from my from a female perspective yeah. is me saying, well, what do I need you for if I'm already giving bringing all of this to the table? Yeah. You also want me to give fifty percent to the the marriage as in financial contribution, yeah. but you want me to be one hundred percent feminine. That's so, uh, yeah, I think I agree with both your points. I think you, they're, both, they're different both perspectives. Are yeah, both are happening. But it goes into the point of what he said earlier is, um, first of all, we don't look at character. We're just like, okay, what can you bring to the table? What can you bring to the table? So I can bring X. These are my assets. These are my assets. Yeah. It's nothing to do with character, which I think we've forgotten about for sure. Yeah. And the other thing is we're not thinking about the other person. We're only just thinking about what do I get from this transaction and that's it. A hundred percent. I think uh, a lot of times when we, we look on social media and you'll see girls and guys these days do these TikToks, you'll see like a transactional view on marriages. Yeah. So it's like there's a lot of women now that post, I don't want to cook. I don't want to clean. Islam tells me I don't have to cook. I don't have to clean. Islam tells me that you have to pay all the bills as a man. Islam tells me this. This is the problem. So, so they're thinking of it as a transactional thing of what they don't need to bring to the table. I think it's the way they're looking at the table. Yes, Islam do say that. Yeah. But that's not the spirit of why it's saying it. Yeah. See, if you're going to use it, you see, the problem I have a lot of the times is people use it as a sh- as a sword and as a shield. Yeah. Mm. When you want to use it, it's like, oh, Islam says I can do this. When you don't, ah, oh, Islam says I don't have to do that. Well, hang on a minute. What about the spirit of something? What about the just sort of, okay, Islam doesn't say you have to cook. I agree with you. Yeah. Right? But you're married. Why not just sit down and kind of go, hang on a minute, lovey. How are you going to do this? You know, yeah. what, whatever happened to just being sensible? Yeah, but again, we don't, and that's one of my biggest, biggest. Aisha knows this. One of my biggest <laughs> yeah. hates is people using religion as an excuse to do something, to or do. as an excuse not to do something, right? And one of the biggest is second marriages. Oh, for sure. For sure, right? Hands down. So yeah. I know somebody who very recently had a second marriage done. It went kaputty. And his wife found out everything. He had it done in secret. Wow, okay. Right, exactly. Even though that's against the spirit of having second marriages, every nikah has to be announced. That's that's just sunnah. You do a nikah, it has to be announced. You can't keep a nikah secret because then it defeats the purpose of having a nikah. The whole point is, it's a nikah, right? Whole thing. Spoke to him. Brother, just completing my sunnah. Just doing the sunnah. <laughs> No, 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 you won't. Don't do that. Okay? You, um, you were itchy. <laughs> yeah. Right? For want of a better word, you're a bloke. You got itchy and you thought, how do I halalify this? That's literally a new word, halalify. I'll have my card done, right? What have you done now is you've taken a religion which has a procedure, it has a process, and it has rights, it has obligations, it has all these things which have been going on for 1,500 years that were set in stone, at that time, on how to do this very sacred thing, which is niqab. And what you've basically done is dismantled it, broke it down, and treated it as a joke for your own nefarious purposes. That's mm-hmm. what you've done. And you've used it as a weapon. You've used it as a shield. Just say, well, actually, I'm just going to hide behind this, that I, uh, you know, I completed my sunnah and stuff. I would rather, as crazy as it sounds, and it's probably going against it, but I would rather someone said, you know what, I just effed around, and I'm done. Why? Because A, you're owning it. You're being truthful to me, you're being truthful to yourself, you're being truthful to, you know, life at large. And you're saying, I'm just effing around, yeah, whatever, yeah. You've not denigrated the religion. You've not used religion to hide behind your own nefarious purposes, to just, you know, undercover, I'm going to do all this. That's what's happening now, is people are too eager to use that, these religious tropes. Whether it's girls, 
well, according to my religions, what's his is his and, and what's mine is mine and I don't have to cook and I don't have to look after his mum and religion says I don't have to look after... I agree with all that. Yeah. But like you said, it's not a transactional list. Marriages don't work like that. Because if marriages work like that, 99% of people who have been married throughout the history of time, including my parents, your parents, her parents, everybody's parents, probably never would have got married. Because yeah. my mum my mom would have turned around to my dad and said, me, you live in a village. <laughs> yeah, you've not got to England yet. You live in a village, what have you got? No, Same. right, do one, do one swipe yeah. left. I'm making sense, yeah. 99% of the people. That's what we've turned into, and marriages can't survive. Or we're not, and marriages are not, and uh, they we're not, you know, androids. We don't go, oh, okay, okay. Human behavior, human impulses, human interaction, character, real, these real human things that we've left behind need to come back into vogue. They need to come back into fashion. Where someone actually turns around and says, I, I, I long for the day when someone actually says, oh, you, I found this rich stuff for your friend, niece, daughter, whoever. He's a nice guy. Yeah. She's okay. a lovely girl. No. He's a doctor. She's Inst a pharmacist. Instantly, yeah. You know, he drives a, he drives an electric car. <laughs> electric. Like, come on, give me a break. Let's go back to that. I say let's go back to that. Yeah, everything's um, very ego driven isn't it right yeah, now of course it is uh, I it's want this and he has to have this and she has to have this but that's why we end up where we are that's why society at this moment in time we've got all these divorce rates we've got all this craziness going on we've got this social media we've got I don't know you go on TikTok and these play things and you just see and you just think but on the flip side though I don't want to say though on the flip side and I think you're going to agree we also have women also have the opportunity to speak out and men to speak out if they're in that position yeah of abuse. They should. Absolutely. You know, and, and a lot of the time they didn't before. No, a lot of the times they didn't. But again, you see, the problem when you have society is it moves on in its goodness and it moves on in its badness. Yeah, yeah. It sure. moves on in both directions. Of course. You have your positives with the society moving on and you have your negatives. Yeah. And this is one of these, you know, and I think like Clear Sky Healing, if we had set this up 35 years ago, hmm. we wouldn't have got a single client. No. We wouldn't have got a single client yeah. because society at that point wasn't ready for these issues that women are facing to be addressed, they were still swept under the carpet. They did, women didn't know that they could talk about these things. You know, my mum in 1980 didn't know that she had an option. Yeah. In 1985, she didn't know. It was like, here's my husband, they're a bunch of kids, I need to look after them and we're just going to carry on. Let's just plow along. Because you know what? Everybody else within that social ecosystem is doing exactly the same thing. Why am I, who am I to sort of break that? But now you see things are developing. So now we have, you're right, there is an uh, opportunity now for moving on, but yeah. by the same token, that same society where years ago, these things that are bad in our, in our society probably didn't exist so openly, now they also exist openly as well. So they, they, it's kind of like stretched, but in both directions. Yeah. yeah. We still get hate. Positive. Don't we? We still get hate. Oh, we hate. get loads of hate. Well, it's, it's, yeah. I'm used oh, to Aisha, it. what are you doing? Yeah. Destroying marriages? You know, mostly men. Mostly yeah. brothers. I, I'll be honest. Mostly brothers sending yeah. me ayat of the Quran. You know, you're not supposed to be destroying marriages. You're not doing this. You're doing this. You're doing this. And I said, look, I have never, I don't think I've ever, 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 in, even in my content, even in, in, in personal relationships in my family, have I ever told anyone to get divorced, first of all. Yeah. And even if they're married, the, the first thing we always recommend is marriage counselling. Pre? Um, yeah. Well, Pre I would say, I would say that a lot of people pre-marriage need to have marriage counselling. For sure. For sure. Like, you know, you think you're going into this. This is the reality of marriage. You know, have you thought about this reality? You yeah. know, we, you think you know what marriage is going to be like. It's actually like this. Are you ready for it? Are you prepared for it? And most people aren't. No, most, they're not. And most people say, I, I don't get married. I don't, I, I'm looking forward to the smoke bombs <laughs> and uh, the hide cars. I, I, that's all I wanted to see. It's the wedding, not the marriage after yeah. the wedding. This yeah. is the problem. It is. The, this, so, this. What do you call it in uh, English? Shonk? What? It's clout. Like eagerness. Clout, it's just a clout it? that clout. people want. Yeah. Um, and that's, we see that's it, all I it is. see it with people spending crazy, silly money booking halls and cars. and Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I'm not saying don't do it. Please, go ahead. Can we do the other bit as well, though? The really important part of it, which is, do you know why you're getting married? How are you going to get married? What marriage entails? And what to do if things start going a little bit wobbly? If you know that bit, have your cars, have your smoke bombs, knock yourselves out. You have really? a, have, it's you the have human aspect of people that we've lost. Yeah. So even post-divorce, we, like, Jav deals with both parties. I deal with just the women, right? Yeah. But even when they come to us, it's, 
I'm going to do this to him. I'm going to say this to him. And petty things. I'm uh, talking about really petty things. You know, using your children, which we have seen um, yeah, both men and women do it. Uh, it's not just men that do it. It's women as well. Um, yeah. We've seen women say things and do things that they... I just think, why? Why, why, why are you doing this? You're making it harder than it already is. Like, leave each other in goodness. If you don't have to, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. So I think that's quite an important uh, point that you made there uh, for the listeners that are listening. Because we probably will get a lot of yeah. men that are maybe saying that this is too one-sided towards women. And men also get abused. And no, they all do. Sure. It, so. I'm not denying that men are also the victim. We're talking about the majority, which yeah. is normally the women. Men, of course they get abused. Men yeah. can be the victim of female rage and female manipulation, let's just say. Yeah. Yes. You know, they say, hell, I have no fury, then a woman scorned. Yeah. And we make it sense. So th- I've seen that as well. I've seen very, very good men being dragged through the mud yeah. because yeah. the women are bad. But then it's on the woman, you know. And the thing is, in this society, a male is always seen, rightly or wrongly, they're seen as a dominant party. They're seen as someone who can just brush themselves down yeah. and just get on with life. You know, that too needs to be addressed. I agree with that. 120%. That, and I think the other thing is that male emotion needs to be normalized. Yeah. Male emotion is, is still seen as a negative. Yeah. It's still seen as a weakness when it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. You know, our Prophet Sallallahu was very emotional. And there's hadith being, him being emotional, him crying, him being angry, him being happy, him being sad. Plenty of them. To show the range. To show that actually this is not weakness in any way. You know, like sometimes you'll... I mean, I've got friends who even now, uh, they, their parents will turn around and say, you know, when he was a kid, he was very emotional. As mm. if it was a bad thing. But as a negative. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's very just bad thing. You know what I mean? And, but yeah. it's not in a good way. It's in a negative way. Oh, he was very angry. He was very angry as a child. He's very, he used to cry a lot as a child. And you go, well, that's an expression of emotion. Harness it, you know, um, sort of try yeah. to try to put it in a straight line, try, yeah. you know, see where it's coming from. And but that's in 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 the males it's still seen in our community as a a weakness. weakness, Yeah, you can't you know man up. Yeah, man Man up up. and sure. So just some advice to uh, our listeners out there that are listening. Maybe some men that uh, might be getting emotionally abused, cheated on by their wives. Maybe for example, uh, their wives are using their kids as a weapon and they're trying to bottle it in and hold it all in like what kind of advice would you give them because you've got the female uh perspective and you see everything from from that side so what kind of advice could you give to those men that hide it and just bottle it all in one of the first things i always recommend is getting into some sort of physical activity so i found that with men especially they to be able to channel that anger and that frustration. So things like boxing, grappling, martial arts really helps them to be able to channel that anger in a way where you're not going to hit someone. Yeah. Because it happens. We see it in uh, we see it in young boys in with, with their parents, you know, in schools, getting into fights, getting detention or whatever it is nowadays they get into um, because of the anger that they are feeling or the frustration between their parents. Let's not forget the kids as well. And then Absolutely. as they're growing older, then we also have brothers, even though we're for women. I still speak to brothers, by the way. They still reach out and they ask the same question, like, how come you only speak to women? Yeah. Um, but if they need help and they need advice, I've always been open to them. The first thing I always say is, like, get into some sort of activity where you can channel that anger and, you know, you can punch a, a punching bag, just pretend it's someone else. Yeah. And it really it really helps them. Um, the next thing is, I would say, is... We do have support works for men, like especially fathers, just not enough. But getting to s- into that community of speaking to other men about what their experience was, what helped them as well, and getting to know like what their rights are. Mm. And I would say the same thing to a woman with this particular, the next thing I'm going to say. Channel your emotions um, in the correct way, but be mindful what you say about your other, the other partner, the ex-partner, to your children and to other people around you because you never know who's listening. You just never know. Um, and this, I always tell my girls this as well, like be mindful what you say about the other person because your children are listening yeah. and they do pick it up. And we do see young girls in school saying, ah, we all know men are never going to do this or we all men are men are trash. Where's that come from? It's come from parents or women are gold diggers. Mm. it's come from the parents or it's come from an adult that has gone through 
been in that position and said something they shouldn't have and they've picked it up and they start internalizing that so we've got to be really important uh, really uh, careful with what we're saying especially around kids it does not matter the age just be mindful of what you say um that's yeah those are the things that i would say what, what would you say i'd say pretty much exactly what you're saying i think mindfulness is the key but going back to what men need to do obviously you can get help there is uh, help i think where a lot of people um make the mistake is clear sky healing is not specifically designed for you know women it's it is more or less designed specifically for south asian women yeah because our community is such yeah now in our community traditionally just our community the male is seen as the aggressor. The male is seen as the dominant one. Yeah. Now, I'm saying I agree with you that, yeah, there are men out there who, who do suffer abuse, who have gone through this abuse. There is help for them, readily help. The difference is, is whether they want to access it or not. Yeah. Now, if they want to access it, it can be there. What happens is, again, culturally, men don't access it, not because they, they, they don't have, the, it's not, it, it doesn't exist. Because of that cultural mindset of man up, janaban, yeah. what are you doing? Why are you crying for? You know, she's gone and what? Move on in it. Yeah. We need to change that mindset. And once that mindset changes, men will be able to access help without that risk of ridicule, without the risk of thinking, oh, I'm not manly enough. I'm not manly if that I've got these feelings. Women, they can have that. Nobody's going to say anything. A woman cries and nobody says anything. Yeah. A man cries, suddenly become a big thing. And that's where the sort of difference lies. I think. But with Clay Sky Healing, like I said, it is predominantly, I would say, obviously, it is sisters that we deal with. Because I think they are the most disenfranchised. They are the most marginalized. They're the ones that need the help. Now, on the back of that, I'm going to do a plug, um, which is basically, <laughs> yeah. we've also set up a program which helps women get back into work. Yeah. So we're getting them work ready. Now, so this basically was born out of a few things. So you've got the Clay Sky Legal, Clay Sky Healing, then what happens is, what do, what do I do with my life? Does that make sense? I'm ready to move on, but move on to what? Does that, you know, like, they've gone yeah. through the divorce. They've spoken to Aisha. They're in a good place mentally now. They, they know how to look after their house. They know how to uh, communicate with the ex-husband, the father of their children. They know the children need looking after. They're ready to now forge ahead. Where do they forge ahead to? A lot of women have been out of the workforce for maybe seven to ten years, maybe longer, depending on how long the marriage was. Yeah. A lot of them don't have any qualifications. A lot of them don't have the experience. So what we do, we've got a new program set up called Whispers of Resilience. It's a six-week program, fully funded. You don't have to pay a penny. All you have to be is living in West Yorkshire and not be in work. And now what we do in the program, which is run by Aisha, what the program does is it gets you ready for work. So what it says is, hang on a minute, you've not been out there in so long. What is work like now? We're not just talking about work as in where is the coffee machine and how do you, you know, pick up an Air Force file and put it somewhere else. It's that resilience of building up your work-life balance, your, your, your rights within the workplace, knowing how to organize your time, everything. It's all there. It's a six-week program. I'll let Aisha talk about it more because she's the one who delivers the program. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I was the one that wrote it too. <laughs> She's the one who wrote it and I'm just, you know, taking the credit. <laughs> no, it's it's one of, um, it's something that is really dear to my heart. And one of the reasons why, the bit of a background is when I got into, first of all, when I became single, one of the first things I would always question is, who's going to hire me now? I'm a mum, right? Like, what do I, how do I balance the cost of like working and then doing childcare and is it worth it because my childcare is so expensive these days yeah. um and i remember at the time being feeling so guilty even as a mom thinking this tiny little baby i mean she's nearly 10 now she's still tiny to me That's but awesome. um this tiny little tiny little baby i'm going to work i'm leaving her here and how how do i how do i deal with those inner conflicts you know when i'm trying to I'm doing good for her, like I'm trying to provide for her, but also I'm not spending enough time with her. And that eventually led us to entrepreneurship, which whether you're married or single or never been married or divorced or widowed, I always recommend women getting into something. Yeah. Whether that's a hobby at home, whether you're doing something like um, crochet, or whether that's knitting, whether that's looking after cats or working fine. Um, or entrepreneurship, selling something from home, home cooked food, um, hijabs, whatever it is, doing something. Because when you do that, you're channeling that boredom even that you have, that loneliness that you have into something more meaningful. 
and for us and for me especially was working with women that had I had uh that had gone through the same experience as me and then creating a whole business out of it and so what I've done is created six modules to be able to get the woman from feeling really uh, what's the word I'm looking for from feeling really lonely feeling like hey I, I'm never gonna get into the workforce to then by the end of it feeling like hey I can write the cover letter now I can send a CV I can speak to someone and say hey are you offering a job negotiate my hours if I need to and that takes skill it takes yeah. a lot of skill but what women don't realize is by looking after their houses their children and all of that there's so many skills they already have massively like it's about channeling them. It's about channeling looking after your house them is channeling them. Yeah, it is. Looking after a house is no joke. You gotta be organized, you gotta make sure that your children are on time for school, madrasa runs, having you know, clothes set out for themselves or for the kids, lunches, all of this stuff. It's time management. It's more stressful than a full time job, definitely. Lit- yeah. Literally. And so I always have to remind women, like I, I don't think you realise you have more skills than you think. Yeah. You do not have to go to university to have this fancy qualification to do something obviously some professions you have to but my point is some of the women that we come through our doors really feel like they have nothing that they don't know anything sometimes they have to go on to build those skills which is fine and we can help them getting into that but there's other times it's just a confidence issue and so that's that's why we've gone from teaching them skills but we've gone beyond that teaching them what confidence is balancing your house balancing your financials you know how do you know what's coming in and out? Because a lot of women don't do that. They don't know their books. They don't know their numbers. Yeah. And working game, entrepreneurship especially, is a numbers game. You have to know what's in and out, what's going, what you need, what you need to save for, all of these things. And so when they come to us, it's like they come with a whole mantle full of just stuff to us and then we just organize it for them. And that's why I created this course to get women into work, to make them understand that you have more, like life is worth more. You build on the skills you have. And not only that, I think getting them ready for work also gives them uh, that degree of independence, that degree of confidence, self-worth. You know, when you go out there and you work, someone employs you, someone's paying you, you you feel something deep inside you, which for years you thought I might not feel because of the situation I was in. Yeah. But then suddenly you're, you're part of a team, you're part of something that wants you, that is actually paying you to get there, but you need to get there though. And that's what with this Whispers of Resilience, which is a program, that's what it offers. And like I said, it's a completely free program. And I think anybody who's looking for, for, for something like that to get back into work or even looking to basically just, just you know, increase your self-worth, self-confidence, boost your self-esteem to go, right, I'm going to start looking for work. This program is definitely for them. You guys have got the experience uh, with marriages, marriages breaking down. What kind of advice could you give those listeners to build and have a happy and healthy marriage so for men and for women uh, as a man what can i do to bring the best uh, to my marriage and vice versa to women what kind of advice could you give so we can really push out some positive energy as well okay so i think for both men and women the first thing is we already mentioned it which is premarital counseling so when you're going into premarital counseling actually let's start before that before that is first of all i would say is know who you are and I know that's so cliche. People say, oh, you got to know who you are. But I mean this in a serious sense, as in know what your values are, right? Because we do have men and women come to us saying, hey, actually, Aisha, I didn't want to have more kids, but he did want more kids. And that's where the conflict started, right? Or, or the other way around. So know what you want from your life. Like, what does your life plan look like roughly? Things are not always going to go to plan. That's fine. And know what you are willing to to put into a marriage or a relationship and some things that you're not willing. So for some people, they don't want to move abroad. Some people, they don't want to have more than a few children. Some people don't want to move from their city. That has to, you have to nail that. But you also have to have things that are a little bit negotiable. So... Some may say, actually, I'm okay to this ethnicity, this ethnicity and this, but I don't want to be associated with these type of people. That's okay as well. You know, so know what it is and the other things that are not negotiable and negotiable as well. So two things, know what you want from your marriage and from yourself as well. And know what you're able to kind of compromise on that. It's not going to be a big deal if this happens, but your preference would be this. 
The second thing I would then say is, say you meet a man or you meet a woman, I would say come together with families, of course, but also you two go to premarital counselling together. And that will also, the counsellor, what they usually do is ask you these types of questions like, how many children do you want? Um, are you looking to um, move abroad? Like, what does your deen look like now? Your religiosity, what is that like now? Do you want to increase it? Do you want to do these types of things? And so they'll be able to draw out those things from each person. And you're still able to say yes or no at the end of that. Like, mm, I'm not sure about this person. Or, yep, yeah, this person seems good. But having open communication is so vital. So learn how to communicate with people. If you're angry, learn to communicate and say, I'm angry right now. I'm going to come back. Because men do that a lot. Like, they, they can just ghost. They can just go. And women think he's left me like what am I gonna do was it me what did I do did I not make the did I not make the food right all it is is he just needs five minutes or he just needs a day to think about what you said so if we if we know each other well there's a great book I just recently read called is it men are from Mars and women are from Venus mm, okay. right I am going to send this out to everyone that signs up for us now because this book is so good and even for me I it really made my eyes open to think that's why that's why like my brothers do that or that's why my sister does this you know it, it doesn't have to be in the romantic relationship but it made me understand men and women different and the guy has it pr almost spot on you know how women react with certain things and how men react with certain things and it put my whole life into perspective so I recommend anyone reading that particular book the thing after I would say is get to know your rights and responsibilities. Like we've mentioned a few, haven't we, before? Like, oh, women don't need to do this in Islam. Men don't need to do this in Islam or do need to do this. But know what you need to do to make a good relationship. You might not need to cook, fine. But when you really want to be with someone and you want them to be happy, you will do things to make them happy. So what if it's not like obligatory to do it so get to know your rights as well and mine's controversial I always say get to know the basics of what happens in a divorce and the reason I say that is many many women have unfortunately come with tours and not understood that whatever he said is actually classed as a divorce and so I don't say it to put fear into people, but I say it as in get to know the basics of what he can and can't say or what you can and can't do so that it can go smooth sailing. What do you mean by that when he says the luck or... Like, yeah. No, there's certain, I think there's certain phrasing and yeah. certain Isn't things it? that you can say to women which then takes you out of the fold of nikah, basically. Yep. Really? Yeah, it doesn't have to be the word the luck. The luck. So if, I, you know, if you say to your wife, you know, I, I treat you like the way I treat my mum. Or I treat you, I see you the way I see my sister. Yeah. yeah. You've taken yourself you, out of the car. Yeah. Wow, just by saying Potentially, that. yeah. Potentially, because essentially what you're saying to her, that you're haram, because your mum and your sister is haram to you. Yeah, so yeah, essentially yeah. what you're saying to her is, exactly. you're haram to me. Yeah, but also so, similarly, this also, uh, there's a difference of opinion on this, but that's the same in nikah as well. So if you ask a woman to marry you, um, and she they have witnesses, that nikah is binding. So... You need to be careful of what you say about yeah. Nika and Don't be joking around. <laughs> don't be joking around is what don't, I'm saying. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah, don't yeah, be messing saying around. That. Yeah. But <laughs> people don't take scholarly advice in, no, in matters like this. Advice. Yeah. They take advice that suits them. You know, you will if a guy wants to get married again or guy a girl wants to do anything, they will go ask ten movies. Ten imams will say no, yeah. the eleventh will say yes. They'll yeah. listen to the eleventh one. They listen to the 11th one because yeah. that's what they want to hear. It's not that they want to hear the truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. He's on my side. You know, there's a Mulvi recently, when I say recently, man, or a year, maybe two years ago, who read a Nikah with two guys. Yeah. He yeah. officiated. I think you've seen it, haven't you? Yeah. Right. How many Mulvis do you think them two guys went to before they found him? Yeah. They must have gone to what, 30, 40, 50, 100? They went, are you crazy? Two guys. I'm going to have to do Nikah. Not Jai's, not Jai's, not Jai's. One. Whoever read it, Allah Alam, right? One must have said, well, actually, I found this little loophole which goes here, 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 and using that little loophole, I think I can read your nikah. They've gone, right, you're the man. We're going to follow you. Why? Because it serves our purpose. It serves our narrative. So we're going to go with you now. But going back to the marriage thing, I think understanding for me is the key. Yeah, Understand sure. not just 
each other, understand your culture, understand your religion, understand each other's nature. Know what you're getting. Set who is that girl? Who is that guy? What is she or he about? What are they like when they're angry, when they're sad? What do you know? What is it they want from me? What do I want from them? Expectations are the key for me. Yeah. If you expect, see, if a girl, if I got married to a girl and she expected certain things and I agreed to them certain things, later on I can not then turn around and say no, because that's been the basis of our marriage. That's been the inception of our marriage. Is that we're going to go on holiday three times a year and you're always going to have this flash car and you're always going to do this and you're basing it on things. You're basing it on materialism. You're going to expect that if I agree to it, not a problem. But then I'm now bound by that. Whereas I think a lot of the time, what people don't do is they don't actually just get to know each other, get to know where they want to head in life. What is it you want in 10 years? What is it you want in 20 years? I mean, with regards to kids and things like that, I'm not that strict. Now, when I say I'm not that strict, life changes. Life yeah. is fluid, right? I've got a very, very close friend and he got married and I kid you not. He said to me, he goes, I'm not having a kid for four years. He was <laughs> adamant. He was like, I'm not having a kid for four years. I want to enjoy my life. I want to, me and my wife, we're going to go out. We're going to see the world. We're going to get to know each other. And it's going to be brilliant. Yeah. He dropped a kid 10 months later. <laughs> I was like, hang on a minute. What, 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 what is this? Right. But life is fluid. Yeah, and alhamdulillah, is. they've been married 20 something years now. Yeah. And it's beautiful because you can't, the other, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't set things in stone. Certain things are set in stone. Certain things are set in stone. And you have to abide by that. Now, if you can't abide by that, then don't get married. But a lot of the things in life are fluid. Like, you know, when people say, oh, I only want two kids. You're saying that now. You might have one. Three years later, you're going, man, I don't want any more kids because this kid's an effing nightmare. I definitely don't want any. You might have two and you might turn around and say, actually, you know what? I won't mind the third one. You don't just turn around, well, hang on a minute. When we met and you said to me you only wanted two kids, so I'm not giving you any more kids. I'm not having any more kids. Life is fluid. It's the understanding. It's that basis of having two parallel tracks that is the key you have a parallel track the husband and the wife it's going to go in one direction once you start going like this your marriage is over regardless of whatever things are happening regardless of everything else you know you've had enough kids and you've done this and you've done that and you've agreed on everything else you're going to start going in a different direction get to know your partner and i always say this is me i'm a bit of an old schooler and i was i always say when you get married to a girl look at her mom when you get married to a girl look at her mom because that has been the foremost influence, female influence in your wife's life. So if her mum is of a certain ilk, let's just say, that's what your wife is most likely going to turn into. Girls, when you get married to a guy, look at his dad. Look at his dad because that's his idea of manliness. That's his idea of responsibility. That's his idea of masculinity. And if you don't like what you see, that's what your husband is most likely going to turn into. Because that's what he's been seeing as he's been growing up. This is what a bloke is. This is what a man is, right? That's what he's going to turn into. That's why I would say, if a girl, look at the guy's dad. If you don't like what you see, maybe step back, maybe rethink. Girl, guys, you get married to a girl, look at her mom. If you if you don't like the mom, because she's got like blonde hair and she's got you know lipstick on and you know she's of a certain age and she's still giving it full ten and she's still going to shisha bars, back off, mate. Because that has been the biggest influence, female influence in your wife's life. Those are I would say those are the big things for me. With regards to what Aisha said, 100%, get to know your rights. Know what Islam teaches you. Know, know what, what, what is expected from you as a husband and wife. But a lot of these things are not even Islamic. They're just life. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Like, you know, like you're sat here, I'm sat here. God forbid if you suddenly got ill, I'm not going to turn around and say, well, I'm not going to give him a glass of water. It's not my obligatory duty. Yeah. No, I'm a human being. You're a human being. I'm going to go get some water. I might ring an ambulance for you, blah, blah, blah. Same, same. Right? So a lot of these things are not, they're not rigid. They're nothing to do with Islam or knowing X, Y, they just, just be human with one another in a nice way. And if you want to know your actual rights, yeah, go out, read, research them and get that done. Yeah, that makes sense. So what are the dangers of not using your business then? That if, uh, if somebody's going through a divorce and they don't have the support structure and uh, guidance and advice that you guys offer? I don't think, well, when you say us, yeah. I think people once they're going through a divorce they need to especially girls i would say you need to get some help you need to get some clarity on your emotions you need to get some clarity on where you're heading where you are at that moment in time because you're going to be all over the place now i've seen obviously women i've seen guys do crazy things i've seen girls do crazy things i, yeah. I remember i remember this one girl not so long ago she got divorced we sorted everything out and then literally like i got a phone call about a week later i'm gonna guess after we sorted everything out and I was like, how's it going? You okay? How, cool. What happened? And she goes, oh, 
you know, need to talk to you. And I said, you know, what happened? She goes, well, basically, you know, long story short, um, one of her friends said, you got divorced, you're ready for, to get married again, even though she'd literally been divorced, I'd say, four months, if that. She'd not sought any help, she'd not sought any guidance, completely on her own. Friend went, go on this app, these Muslim apps, whatever you want to call them, marriage apps. She met a guy, guy texts her, let's go for dinner. Boom, she's gone to dinner etc etc so she's telling me this she goes oh you know java met him went for dinner i'm thinking okay i said you go well she went yeah it went really well i said what happened after that she went well we got in his car and then we drove around for a bit we were still chit-chatting and she goes then he said listen i'm not i don't live that far away do you want to do you want to come back she went yeah went back long story short she ended up sleeping with him right so she told me that openly okay probably not a good thing that was on monday tuesday she's then met up with another guy and done the same thing wednesday she took a break bless her I'm not joking. Wallahi, I'm not joking, right? Thursday, she's gone out and done it again. Now, in my head, she's rang me, and I'm like thinking, okay, that's a lot of to unpack there. I said, but what made you sleep with these guys? She was like, I've been married 20, 25 years. I don't know how these things work in the sense, like, I'm with the guy. He likes me. I like him. I've not had that attention, mind you, yeah. for a very long time. Very long time because she's been in really bad marriage, very bad place. She goes, I've not had that attention in a very long time. One thing's led to another. She doesn't have the tools. She didn't have the tools to actually step back and go, hang on a minute. What's going on here? What's, you know, what have I been taught? What have I learned? She's just gone with the flow and that's where the flow's taken her yeah. because that's where the guy wanted the flow to go. Yeah, Am I making yeah, sense? Course, yeah. Right. So she's just literally gone along thinking, I'm getting this attention. This is amazing. And then she's done it again the next day thinking, hang on a minute, I'm still getting the attention. Like, I can just go out and do crazy thing. Yeah. And then right. once she actually stopped and realized that, hang on a minute, this is not good. Like, from an Islamic, or certainly 120%, from an Islamic perspective, not only that, from a mental perspective. Yeah. How no. long are you going to keep doing that for? Yeah. <clears throat> All you're doing is you basically... You're, you're making the same mistake over again and then allowing yourself to make the same mistake over again. So eventually, I think in the end, I think I passed her on to yourself. I think Aisha had a word with her. And now she's in that where she's reading. She's uh, when I say reading, she's actually like reading books that Aisha's recommended to her that can actually help her with the thought process, with everything like, going, OK, I, I know why I'm having these impulses. I know why I need because a lot of the time people are masking stuff. Yeah. You know, they yeah. just want to they just want to get rid, you know, and it's just. It's, and I think girls are more susceptible when they don't know their rights or their they don't know their basically their inner mind. And I get I get a lot of this. I had another girl. This was years ago, absolutely years ago. And this is when I say people like with this girl, the one I was telling you about, who slept with three guys in like four days or something. They're so institutionalized in their marriage that they can't see the wood for the trees. They don't know anything else. They don't know. So I had this one girl years ago, and she was from. Uh, up near mid, uh, not Midlands, sorry, uh, Lancashire ways, somewhere around Lancashire ways. Getting divorced. Husband's got a house. In them days, you're going back, like, I don't know, I think it must have been 09, 10, worth a quarter of a mil, cashed out f full. He's about to sell it. I said to her, lovey, we can put a, a charging order on it. We can put a stay order. She was like, no. And I said, why? She went, I went to speak to my bead. <sighs> I remember you telling me this. Yeah, she goes. I went. To, I, went, I spoke to my Pete, and my Pete said, "Don't do it. He is going to come back to you on Wednesday, on Tuesday." She came to see me on the Wednesday before. I went. Okay. I said, "You do realize that on Friday they're going to complete. If they complete, we're not seeing that quarter of a mil, right? He's he's done. He's got the cash. Boom. He's gone. He's flown." She's like, "No, my Pete said he's coming to you on Tuesday. Not a problem." Wrote to the other side, said, yep, yeah, whatever, cool, cool. Friday comes, sales gone through. My man's got a quarter of a mil. He's scarpered. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I rang her on Wednesday. Come and see me, she come and see me. I said, has, has it come back to you? She went, no. I said, has the house sold? She went, yeah. I said, have you had a word with this speed guy? She went, yeah. I said, what did this speed say then? Because he assured you that your ex-husband was going to come back to you. She went, my speed said to me, that the angels who, give the, who gave him this information, 
the angels have not given him permission to tell me why my husband hasn't come back. Yeah. Okay. So this beard guy is saying to you that the angels know, he knows, but he hasn't been given permission to release that information to you. So now you tell me, where does that leave you? Because the house is gone. The quarter of a million is gone. And you're none the wiser. And this beard guy's hasn't got any consequences. He's walked away scot-free. Um, your ex has walked away scot-free and you're in the doodah. Now, this is what I mean is that when you're so closed up, if you just step out a little bit, you're in the marriage and you're so like, da -da 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 this is my life, this is what I know, this is what I know, this is what I know. When you step out, you go, hang on a minute, this is crazy. This is a whole different level of crazy. I shouldn't be doing this and I shouldn't be thinking like this. Yeah, But people do. And that's why they end up doing either what the first girl did or what this second girl did, they end up doing crazy things. And it's just, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I think education levels or something on it, but it's just absolutely bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. It's crazy how people are like so ingrained. It's, it's so ingrained into their minds, you know, these beliefs, to put it very mindly, because, you know, when I was going through my separation, so when I'd moved into the refuge, I had a very, very good friend who used to always come around to my house, etc. And, um, she was getting married as I had left, right? So she had gone back home. She'd gotten married to someone that she approved of. It was all well. They'd gotten to know each other, etc. And um, I get a call from one of my other friends saying, Aisha, one of the reasons she's not speaking to you anymore or kind of trying to fade you out is because you're going through a separation and you may get a divorce. So her to-be husband slash husband, whatever he was then, said to her, don't speak to Aisha now because, you know, you don't want a divorced woman around you. We've just gotten married. That's cultural. Yeah. And we've recently come to find out that he came over to England. Um, there was abuse of some sort. I don't know which way it actually happened. He's had her arrested. She's on bail. Um, she can't sell a house now. She's going through divorce proceedings. She's got all sorts of criminal things put against her by him. Um, and the other way around. So they've both been arrested by each other, right? Uh, and their claims. And she's going through a divorce now. And she, she found me on social media, one of our videos that we put up. And she's like, yeah, I, I'm going through it now, Aisha. And that hit me really hard because I, I really loved her. I thought she was a really good friend. She was nice. Um, but to be like kind of dropped by a person like that yeah. But that's really the cultural stereotype and that's the cultural stigma that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Or oh, she's a divorcee. Don't hang out with her. Otherwise, you're going to get divorced. Essentially, what they're doing, and this is one of my yeah. pet peeves with the Asian culture, South Asian culture, is personal accountability and personal responsibility practically doesn't exist. Oh, okay. We're happy to throw on somebody else. Oh, it's his fault. It's her fault. It's the bee's fault. It's Flana's fault. It's her fault. She, you know, what about you? I got, I, I, I got this client. It's, this is hilarious, right? Her daughter went to uni. Her daughter went to uni. She never left Bradford. Daughter went to uni, whatever, whatever. Boom, boom. My friend's gone down to see her on a night. She's walked into the flat. Her daughter's on the floor, sparked out, drunk, completely gone, right? First year student. She wakes her daughter up. Mum, where am I? She's seen mum panic. Mum, where am I? What happened? Blah, blah. Mum's like, you stink of alcohol. What the hell's going on here? She's going, honestly, God, mum, I don't know what happened. Uh, one minute I was okay and I was doing my homework and then you've just found me now. Yeah. And my friend, well, I call her my friend, my ex-client. She's like, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? okay? Come on, sit down. Come on, sit down. And then she's like, uh, has anything else happened? Because I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going on, blah, blah. And you can tell this girl's trying to answer. I don't know. And, you know, mom's like, oh, my God, I hope nothing else bad has happened, blah, blah. This girl, anyway, this woman came to see me, the mom. She's telling me this story. And I'm like looking at her and I said, with all due respect, I said, have you not thought that she's 18, 19, first year at uni, she's never left her hometown, she's never left her own bloody house. She might just be enjoying herself in a haram way i'm not i'm not justifying in any way but this is what happens at uni people do go and they do things no 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 mm -hmm. not my daughter she's definitely under the influence i think there's some jinn put in her and i yeah. think someone's doing like kala jadu and i'm looking at her thinking i know why you're saying that 
See, because if you have to admit the truth, if you have to admit that your daughter might have done these things, even out of experimentation, even out of, you know, I'm away from home, I'm at uni, I might as well try something. But if you admit that, that's a reality you're going to have to confront now. That's a reality you're going to have to admit to, and you're going to have to do something about that. And you might have to have some painful conversations with your daughter about that. And you're trying to avoid that. Now, because you're trying to avoid it, you're blaming something else. Enjoy. You're negating that responsibility. You're taking that responsibility out of it. And I get it in divorces all the time. Yeah. I get in divorce all the time. Oh, Black magic. He's got gin in him. Yeah. I'm like, well, what has he done? Honestly, I had an auntie come in with a daughter. A daughter just sat there and she was like, I think my son-in-law's got a gin in him. And I said, auntie, mm -hmm. why? He goes, he does a lot of gambling. And he goes after the gorilla. And he goes after drinking. I'm like, that doesn't sound like a gin, mate. <laughs> that just sounds like my man wants to have a good time. He's just like, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm out of here. Yeah. No, 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 no. Because why? Gin is secondary, isn't it? Blame someone else. Soon as they say, actually, he does that. And then you go, why is he doing that? Ooh, we've got some awkward questions to answer now. We're going to have to be introspective now. We're going to have to look inside us and look inside the marriage to see where it went wrong. Uh -uh. Let's just blame it on something else. Let's blame it on them. You know? They'll never say, oh, you know, I, I, I remember when we were kids and there was, a, there was like a thing that if you went out, like if anybody got caught going out on a night, like me and any of my mates and myself or whatever, the parents never used to say, why did you do that? They'd say, who made you do that? Yeah. 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 Does that make sense? So if I came home, or if my mates went home, let's say we smell like I was sick for argument, say any 15 year experimenting, having a little fag or whatever, right? They wouldn't say, have you been smoking? They'd say, who made you smoke? <laughs> Straight who away. To, who gave it to you? Who gave it to you? Who, who you made with? you smoke? So what they're doing is bypass your responsibility, bypass your uh, sort of role in all this and they've gone straight let's blame somebody else and whilst we have that culture that blame culture and negating of personal responsibility within the south asian community we're not going to get anywhere no. i tell you that now we're not going to get anywhere because all we're going to keep doing is brushing crap under the carpet yeah. and whilst we do that we're never going to progress as a society simple as that so have you ever met a client where you've uh, you've thought i can't change this person or i can't help this person and what have you done in that situation yes so we didn't realize at first, right? Because when a woman comes to us or when he's when the woman is referred, we have like a vetting process, right? So you ask a few questions. What have you done so far? Where are you right now on this journey? Um, and all of those questions that this person, this woman uh, answered were, f were good. Like she needed help. She came to me a few years ago, actually. I remember having a conversation with her and then she went silent. And she recently is in the last year or two came back came back asked us if we could help her and from our perspective she was a woman who had been uh this is her second marriage this was her second marriage excuse me and um she'd gone through a lot of abuse he'd left like just completely gone no conversation no nothing although the marriage was rocky she never thought he'd go right she never thought he'd just up and leave didn't tell her and so when someone tells when someone says that to me i automatically think okay that is not a nice thing to do to anyone whether you're a man or a woman um so she tells me okay he's left um he's not giving me a divorce he's telling everyone that um we're still married i still very much love her he's gone and got married about 2 weeks after he's left so he's in second marriage and so now I'm thinking, oh, okay, we've we've got a really sticky situation on our hands. But what as we go on onto the journey, I come to realise actually she she was stalking him. Um she was calling him through private number just to hear his voice and quickly you know, um put it down just to hear him. She was sending letters to his house as well like hey um you know you should really think about going back to your wife etc um she was hearing from other people what the new wife was like and she was bad mouthing her in the community and in all this time he was still fighting um, a court case with her and he was also like trying to get back together so he eventually started saying things like okay let's get counseling let's go to this person let's go to this person but the thing is one of the things she always did was brand her ex-husband as a narcissist um but not to speak about his character because you shouldn't just up and leave but one of the things that came up for us is she took no responsibility for where she was and what she was saying 
So she would come back with the same questions again and again and again. But when I tasked her, so what we do in our coaching sessions, we give you tasks to do. So you're going to go away, you're going to do this, X, Y, Z. So it's active. You're not just sitting around. We're not just, I'm not, I don't just sit there and listen to your story. And um, they were never done. Oh, I'm busy, Aisha. But I've got kids, Aisha. I can't do it, Aisha. And so what I had to do is I had to like start tasking her harder. What that means is I want you to report back to me every day. No exceptions. Weekends as well. And I don't even work on the weekends. To make sure that she had that accountability. Because what we come to realise is she'd gone through so many different therapists. Like, I can't even count. She'd gone to this person. She'd gone to, like, a Hakim. She'd gone to um, the person that works on the feet, what they're called. Uh, podiatrists. Okay. Through all of the health conditions that she had because of the trauma she'd gone through. She'd gone through a reflexologist. She'd gone through a hypnotherapist. She'd gone to a CBT uh, trauma therapist. All these people. But she was like, oh, no, they're not doing any good. You cannot go through 10, maybe 20 different people, helping practitioners is what we call them, and then say, oh, no, they're all no good. Because to me, that shows you're not committed. You don't take responsibility, as what Jav says. You're not committed to actually putting the work in. And when you're trying to change your life, as we all know here, you can't just say it and not do it. You have to be able to put that work in. Yes, it's hard. It's annoying. Some days you don't want to do it. And I always used to say to her, like, um, and my girls, actually, action precedes motivation. you got to put the action in first and then you're going to receive the motivation. I don't get out of bed every single day wanting to get out of bed. I don't want to always take my girl to school. I don't always want to work. But you have to do it first and then you feel motivated because you see the results. And I have always said this. And that's when we started to realise that she was the one that was doing all of these things, not taking the responsibility, not putting in the work, calling everybody else a narcissist, including her therapists, because they couldn't help her. Or, but the fact of the matter actually was, is it was her not taking the responsibility. It was her not doing the action. It was her that was just like, oh, that person costs too much. Can you, can you give me a discount? And going to a different person and saying, oh, but that person is charging me X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you should charge me this instead because I've got this before. So manipulation at its finest. Yeah. But it's the small little things, the petty little things people do that create the whole mountain of a person. Mm. And that's when you have to be so observant to the person so you realise what they're doing and what they're saying and what they, how they're acting towards you. Because if I say this on a general level, it wouldn't be a big deal. But when you put all the small things together, it would be a very big deal. Because I remember her messaging me, because she had a court case with him, uh, messaging me, saying, hey, Jav's not answered my call. Um, he said he was on holiday. He told me he's going on holiday, but can you get a message to him? And I remember saying to her, like, I, I, don't, I don't live with him. No. I don't know his diary. I'm not accountable for his, his setup. I don't know what you've discussed. But continuously yeah, violating the, our group. So, I mean, with people like rules. that, there's nothing you can do. You have no. to let them go in the end. Yeah. You know, not, they say not everybody's fixable. No. Because they themselves might be the problem. Yeah. I mean, making sense. It's not necessarily that you know everybody who comes to us are claiming to be a victim is a victim. They're they not. could be the the aggressor masquerading as a victim. Yeah, and then once you people. peel away, you realize that. Hang on a minute. It's not always his problem. You're the issue. You're the problem. For you're sure. Always, yeah. But because you're never going to see it, you got you got like blinkers on you. You ain't ever seeing it. And then, sell a is what it is. I think a lot of people have the victim mindset. Regardless yeah, of course, yeah. For sure. And that's what we deal with on a daily, though. Yeah. With the victim mindset, there's two people. There's one person who genuinely is in that position and they think, <clears throat> I really can't see a way out. So there's people like us that will say, okay, let's do this, let's do this, and let's do this. And they get on with it. They find it hard. We're not saying here that it's not going to be hard. Yeah. I always tell my girls it's going to be hard, but that's what I'm here for to be to help you keep keep you accountable. But then there's the other person who will stay in that and say, "Oh no, what I should do that, but I'm not going to do that." In other words, and that's what this woman did. She kept saying, "Yeah, I know. I haven't done what you told me to do. I haven't done what you told me to do. No, that's too hard. I have. I don't have time." And so, over time, if you're putting in the effort as that leader, as I was, 
you have to come to the understanding if if a person does not want to help themselves there's nothing you can do there's nothing you can do you can't help somebody who's yeah. not willing to help themselves because they don't take responsibility so do you ever see uh, marriages that are really short like uh, they'll get married and then a few months later they divorce three them? weeks three yep. weeks three 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 yep. weeks is the shortest one i've seen yeah honeymoon basically went on honeymoon came back went ah not gonna happen yeah. And when the marriages are that short, like what's the reasoning? Is it just the, the clash? Craziness. The craziness. A lot of it's craziness. Yeah. Something they haven't told each other. Um, how can I say it politely? Habits that the wife doesn't like or habits that the husband doesn't like. And you find out straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you find out on honeymoon, don't you? <laughs> yeah. That, you know, I had a, I've, I've had some, I've had one that which was absolutely crazily bonkers, uh, which I can't actually... I don't think I'm. I don't think I could say it on you can't, no. uh, on podcast. We're, we're waiting for a story. Like, uh, what, what? Give us some. Uh, give he us had the peculiarities in the bedroom. Let's just say that much. But they weren't necessarily in the bedroom. He just had certain things, like fetishes and stuff. Fetishes, right? And that she just were like, "Are you off your trolley?" Right. Like he would just basically, you know, I could probably. I, he he would basically get a string, yeah, uh, wrap it around his manhood. And then tell her to wrap it around her big toe. And then he would get on all fours and she'd have to walk him around. <laughs> I mean, you can't make that shit up if you tried. With all due respect, you couldn't make that up. And this was on honeymoon. So literally, they got back from honeymoon. And she just came running to me. I think by that time, she'd cut the string. Was why it would have been awkward. <laughs> yeah. So she came running to me and she was like, I went out. And I was like, what? And she was like, did it, did it, did it. And I was like... Okay. <laughs> That's a valid reason. Really good reason, to be honest. Uh, but again, you don't know until you know. Like, you know, you you don't know this person in that way until you don't until you don't basically um, get to know. I mean, you get, I've had two cases where the guy was impotent. He was completely impotent and he never told the wife before he got married. And she found out on honeymoon. Uh, unable to have kids. Well, I, I, um, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't, he couldn't get his flag up. Okay. He, he couldn't salute. Let's just say that much. I, but he never told his wife. He never yeah. he never told her. He knew, but he never told her before marriage. So in that case, they basically, uh, we apply for an annulment. So you pretend that the marriage never happened. So you can get it annulled, basically. If it's within a certain period. Yeah, within a certain period. And obviously, there's a certain criteria, very strict criteria, uh, that you can only apply for an, um, an annulment. But, the, you know, that, that's the, that's that's the, the yeah. sort of craziness. What would you say in that situation? What kind of advice would you give to him then? If he, if he, if he can't do that and he wants to get married... Just be open and honest from the beginning. You have to Who's be. that, the first guy or the second guy? <laughs> the first guy's a real... No, I think yeah. the first guy probably needs to go to a crazy place like Amsterdam or somewhere else where they can, they can uh, you know, really look after him properly. With the second guy, I, I, you know, I really would... I'd just say to him, listen, why are you going to lie? Because I know it's, it sounds crazy, but it's not a lie you can hide. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's not like, you know, it's not like you've got some disease... Like you're, you know, and you're on. You know, it's the disease is an invisible disease. Yeah. Like, you know, you've got a stage one cancer, right? You can hide stage one cancer. You just kind of go right. Okay, I'm just going to the doctor. Them. You know, there's no physical manifestation, but here you're hiding something which, within a matter of days, is going to come out. Straight away. Yeah. Straight away. And you know, there's no point ruining another person's life. Why lie to them or why ruin their life, just for the sake of again, probably his parents put him up to it. Stuff like that. I'd go, one girl who got married to a guy who was who was uh, who was gay, yeah, uh, and he told her within a matter of days after, that, yeah, that listen, I'm gay, but they spent ninety grand on a wedding, <gasps> right? So I'm not the one who's going to tell him. And then I think she literally waited, uh, I think it was about seven months, because she was trying to figure out the best way to navigate. Again, it becomes about the bigger thing. She was trying to figure out a way of navigating it in such a way that she didn't get into trouble, he didn't get into trouble, and the family's walked away with a clean face. Yeah. Because she thought, if I go to my mum and dad, or if I tell his parents that he's gay, they're going to say, there's nothing wrong with him, it's you. you. Does that make sense? You don't know how to, you know, keep him happy. And that's why he is the way he is, because you're not very good. You know, it becomes, a, again, it becomes victim blaming. Yeah. And so you get, you, the short marriages, I think the shortest one I've seen is probably... Two weeks, I think, went on honeymoon, came back. She applied for an annulment or a divorce. Well, it won't be a divorce. It would be an annulment. Uh, I think that's probably the shortest one I've seen. I, I have a client whose brother-in-law is gay. And he's told the whole family. He's told the whole family. He's told his parents. Told the brother. Well, is he, he married? 
he is not married. He's right. young. So he's basically told them, I'm never going to get married. <clears throat> yeah. But what the struggle is, so the woman that I'm supporting right now, is her struggle is, how do I how do I approach this? Because my husband has just basically said, I'm not doing anything, dealing with this. It's too much for me to understand. There's nothing to deal with. No, sure. that's, that's what I said. I said, yeah. as long as he doesn't act upon it, what, what can you do? Is it the husband's brother? Yeah. Okay. And she got, but the thing which, which I found kind of funny, she said, but I treat him like my sister. Interesting. I said, what do you mean? She said, there's a lot to psychologically there. There's a lot to unpack there. So said, she's got a brother in law who's gay and she treats the brother in law who's she gay. Goes, oh, I can be like around him. We can do girly things. And I'm, <laughs> I, I just, mean, I think we're just promoting a cliche now, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if he, but if he, to be fair, if he's prancing around like a fairy with all due respect, then I'm not surprised she treats him like a girl. But on a serious point, on a very, very serious note, if he is, if she's treating him like a sister, then either. Either he, either she has got a different view of what a bloke needs to be, or she's got a very open view of what a bloke yeah, needs yeah. to be, and maybe he's very sensitive, and she's thinking this is what a girl should be. A bloke shouldn't be like that. Therefore, I'm gonna look at him like a sister. Does, do you understand the crazy logic there? <laughs> We're going bloke. into crazy things. No, but yeah, this is what we have to deal with. I know, now. but does that mean yeah, like, yeah. what I'm saying is that she thinks a bloke shouldn't be like that? Yeah. Right. I'm not talking about his sexuality. Yeah. A bloke shouldn't be like that. So she thinks of him as a female yeah. because maybe he's in tune with his emotions or he's emotionally available. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it's got nothing to do with his sexuality. So I'm saying maybe she also needs educating that. Hang on a minute. Men can be emotionally open. And he needs to, I don't know, whatever he's doing, he needs he to, don't act upon it, whatever you do, because that's haram. Am I yeah. making sense? Yeah, but yeah. there is a lot to unpack there, for, both from her perspective and from his perspective. Yeah, it was a big, it Good was a long session. One. It was uh, a long conversation. I like seeing the invoice on that one then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, there's some interesting, crazy cases there. You get yeah. all sorts. You just get yeah. all sorts. Wonderful, weird people, to be honest. Honestly, Humans I think we have to also keep our sanity, though. Yeah. So, you, you know, there are times that we have to tell each other, like, what's actually going on that day, or et cetera. Or, you know, this person has told us this for, you know, safeguarding reasons even as well. Mm. But we have to then look after ourselves. So what we tell our clients, we also have to make sure that we're doing ourselves. Because if we're not, first of all, hypocritical. Yeah. Second of all, I don't think we'd ever sleep again. No. Like, with the things that we hear, I I really, without sounding too much, we would not sleep because some of the things are just so heartbreaking. Some of our clients have gone through incredible amounts of abuse. And I'm not only talking about their husbands or their ex-wives, um, wives or uh, husbands. I'm talking about childhood abuse as well yeah. that they've yeah. gone through. But that, that then informs their relationship, doesn't it? So yeah. You've been through a lot when you were a kid, emotionally, physically, abuse-wise, whatever it is that's going to then inform what your future relationships, because what you're seeing as a child and what you've experienced as a child, you're going to carry that on into your yeah. own adulthood. Then that's what you think relationships are about. That's how you think things are sort of done. Um, but we, yeah, we get all sorts. We try to, I wouldn't say detach yourself, but you know, you, you can't take these things home with you. you oh, I think you're providing a valuable uh, service uh, that is needed and it's quite a niche bespoke service. Yeah. Very uh, much. That's uh, there's a big demand for. So, a huge respect to you for that and i like how it's clear sky legal and then uh, you've got the healing and now you've got the next one so i can see the whole <laughs> umbrella of clear <laughs> sky brand coming in yeah all coming in inshallah inshallah yeah. why not why yeah. not i remember when you came to me with this discussion mm. and i was sat in your office I, I don't remember what i went for and i remember you saying asha i've got this um preposition for you but it's a bit controversial now I was I was prepared for it because he's controversial anyway. Yeah. Right. And I was like, okay, because what do you think about us doing it together? And we'll do clear sky, and then you can you can come up with the logo, which I did. I I designed that, mm. and you can it's gonna be yours. And I was like. But we're already doing this together anyway. We would always send clients to each other anyway. Yeah, we did a lot of live. Let's well go ahead with it. And I think I remember saying, just give me a minute, give me give me a minute to think about this. And then coming back to you saying, Yeah, it's an official yes. Yeah. And we're like, Yep, so it the next day papers were already drawn up. It was like so fast. So fast. Everything just yeah. you know, but why wait? I'm we haven't say. looked back since then and no, then that's been the good. And like I said, we keep expanding in terms of where where our reach wants to be, what we want to do the type of healing, the type of, we've got different yeah. courses, we've got different programs, different clientele. We're not only are we doing divorce, we're doing lifestyle as well. We're doing the work thing. 
hopefully, yeah. hopefully, touch wood, we've got a few other things going on as well, uh, which I think in due course they'll be they'll come more to the fore. But we, at sure. the moment, we're concentrating on just trying to get these women work ready. Yeah, if we can much. get we can get them work ready, they'll that'll be a massive plus for us, huge plus, and for society as well. Um, we had uh, somebody on our podcast last week that was talking uh, about her hijab and how she was judged uh, in the legal field for wearing the hijab by. Uh, barristers yeah. uh, so for yourself you're wearing the full niqab what's your experience been like with it there has been times so first of all i started wearing the niqab for the first time when i was in secondary school right. i was i don't know 15 16 um and i remember the first time that i adorned it and i was the only person or the only student in school who would wear it and we were not allowed to wear it inside for security reasons and um I remember some family members of mine did not like it. They didn't your, like it. Your own family? Yeah, my own family, immediate family. Um, I remember my dad at first seeing me and saying, you don't, you don't need to do this, Aisha. Like, what's, what's, this, what's the situation? And I remember just saying, like, this is my choice. This is something that I've chosen to do. And I just felt at that time that hijab was not enough for me. And so I wanted to go to the next next level for me. So it's very spiritual for me. Um, and it's not something that any of my family members wear. Anyone in my family. No woman in my family wears a niqab at all. Um, so I'm the only one in my family that does adorn the, the niqab. And I even have uh, family members that don't even wear the hijab. And that's that's okay. So there's... Oh, they're all different yeah so my point here is that no one was the one who suggested it to me no one said anything to me and i know that that's a big issue nowadays um but no it was very much something that came from my heart and it took a bit of time to get there um and then i took a break for a little while so i took a little break for a while um and then i donned it again in 2020 i think again so the break was about three years and then I started wearing it again when I was in, when it was 2020. Um, but what I used to do is I used to fold my niqabs and put them in my pocket, wherever I went, pocket, handbag, whatever, as a reminder of this is where I want to be again in life. Right. Um, so it's, it's very spiritual for me. Um, I mean, I still keep them in because I get them dirty all the time. But it Who's was telling you to do it though? You were pressed. I'll, yeah, <laughs> I think you are oppressed. Aren't you? <laughs> I no. think people are. Do I sound you, and look oppressed? You definitely sound. You look. You definitely <laughs> look and sound oppressed to me. <laughs> no, Who, I think. Tell me, tell me the truth. Who's making you do it? A lot of people look uh, at somebody wearing a niqab, uh, yeah. maybe non-Muslims, yeah. uh, and they'll always be like, uh, a man's make a husband or a father or someone's forcing her to hide herself from society. Uh, that's what they say. Well, okay, first I'll, sorry, I'll tell the truth. She's got really bad ac um, acne. Yeah, that's a good fix. Yeah. <laughs> all over. <laughs> I don't have acne. The secrets now. I don't have acne, but um, no. Um, my own father was actually against it. Okay, like even now, he's like, it's not necessary. Not in a in a please don't do that type of way. Just it's not necessary. Which I come from the opinion that it isn't necessary. Um. But it's something that very much makes me feel very much connected to my religion. Yeah. Right. And I've just I've always continued it in that way. Um, and I also before I even ever got married, I was already wearing the niqab before I got married. Um, so he never said anything to me. Uh, I continued to wear it after I got divorced. So it, marriage isn't the issue here. My father, and my brothers are not the issue here. We're very forward thinking people. Yeah. It's but just your own decision. Just purely on my own thing. And I just very much find it like a blessing for me. Yeah. Really. And, and do you know, like Islamically, um, what's the saying? Like, is it essential? Is it optional? Or There's difference of opinions okay. here. So some people say, yes, it is in, in today's world. And some people say, no, it isn't. It's your choice. So I, that's why I said. I come from the opinion that it's, it's my choice. Okay. Um, and that just keeps me rooted in my faith as well. And in regards to the oppression, though, if you will go to my Instagram, you will definitely find that I'm not, impre you know, oppressed. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, I don't shy away from still being who I am, right? Yeah. I'm still that person who speaks up for herself, who is confident in herself. And that comes with you, with you within you. I don't think that's to do with how you dress. And 
your self-worth and your confidence will always come within you. Now, at first, um, going through, getting into entrepreneurship was a little bit hard because I sometimes would go into meetings thinking, is this going to be an issue, right? Um, And honestly, we've worked with Muslims, Mm non-Muslims. It has never been an issue. The only one time it was a slight issue and I was told not to wear it, was actually when I was employed by a Muslim com- uh, uh, a Muslim company who uh, provided a childcare service. And they told okay. me not to wear the niqab in front of the children there. Right. Even though I was not working with the children. Wow, that's interesting. There Very you interesting. Yeah. And I challenged it. I said, I asked them why. They said, oh, do you know, just, just don't want to scare children. I said, scare children that's that's not because of how you dress it's how you come across you know yeah but the other thing coming with niqab though is a lot of people think that i can't speak english that's the other thing that i come across you know when we go to places they're not sure how to address me which i understand i think i would be it is associated more with foreign muslims yeah yeah it is with like more yeah you sort of arab middle eastern women so there's that connotation straight away that you might be a foreigner and thereby you can't speak English. A lot of people do think I'm Arab anyway, um, which is, I, I don't know where that comes from, but That's people do, do do think that, oh, we're not sure, does she speak English, does she not? And so I have to be the first person who's like, hi, hello. And then they're like, oh, she's okay, she's one of us. you get Arab, I normally <laughs> get mixed race. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's that's been um. It's it's re- it's really sad that a lot of women are told to you know take off the hijab or take off their niqab, because that doesn't take away a cloth piece of clothing doesn't take away from who a person is. Yeah. And if we're in this world, we're allowed to dress how we want. You know, your body, your choice. Then why can this not be my choice? If that's I choose true. to cover more. Why shouldn't that be my choice? Why is it automatically put, oh, maybe it's her father or a man in her life that has told her to do this. Like, women are intelligent and we make very good decisions as well, just as good as sometimes as men. And if I'm okay with looking like this and everybody else is uncomfortable, that's their problem, not mine. Absolutely, 100%. And that's the way it should be. Shall I? Yeah, that's good. I'm sure a lot of people that watch the podcast will drop their comments if uh, with their thoughts. Yeah. Uh, so it's always good to talk about it whilst we're on the podcast. Uh, so no, it's been really insightful. I think to conclude the podcast and maybe just give some final piece of advice to our listeners uh, with your expertise and uh, the industry that you're in, all the young people that are going into marriages, people that are maybe struggling in marriages um, that might want to contact you and vice versa. What's the best piece of advice you could conclude on the podcast? I think open your hearts and close your eyes. Mm. That's good. I think that's the best way. Because if you open your heart, you'll be looking for someone with a similar thought process, similar outlook on life, someone who's, whose heart is after you and yours is after them. You open your eyes, you're going to be after the cars and the houses and the money and the suits. But I'd say close your eyes and open your hearts first and then go into marriage. That's, yeah. that's the key. That's a good shout. I would say marriage is half of your dean, but it is not half of your being. And what I mean by that is... It's marriage, when it's done correctly, it's half of your faith. So, you know, you can collect immense reward for it. But you are still a whole person, which means that you still have responsibility to yourself, you know, to have good character, to have good characteristics, to have good manners and to enjoy your own company as well. The issue we have is when individuals become so engrossed in the other person that they forget who they are. Yeah. And so, obviously, that detachment is more difficult. And this is for both men and women. You still have to nurture yourself, what you like, what you don't like. Go out, have hobbies. I think everyone needs to have hobbies to keep themselves entertained and to get to know themselves. Sit in silence as well. Yeah, well, that's really good advice. I think in this generation, you probably see online, there's a lot of toxicity that's pushed out there mm-hmm. from a female narrative and also a male, uh, masculine uh, narrative as well. So coming somewhere in between and being able to push out more balanced uh, agendas and messages That's what it's uh, is, is key and it's very very rare these days you've always got the one or the other so uh, i think you've been very neutral given some really good information and uh, no i've really enjoyed it 
Thank Brilliant. you for Thank having you very us. Much. And for how do people us. contact you? Uh, I'm sure we'll get you on a part three at some point because there's so <laughs> yeah. much to talk about. It's We've just done a two-hour episode. We could talk for another two hours, but oh, no, easy. Uh, we'll get that in uh, in the part three. But and maybe go a bit more into the business side of things and talk uh, business yeah. Yeah. and how you guys work together in a business setting. Uh, but for this side, I just wanted to get a few themes out there. But how do people contact you? So we are on almost all platforms under Clay Sky Healing. Um, and those were pretty we're pretty active in all especially Instagram Facebook clear sky healing and also TikTok as well but you can also find us on our website which is www.clearskyhealing.co.uk perfect mine just a clear sky legal I think uh, people watching this have seen me before they probably know I'm on TikTok Instagram Facebook um, clear sky healing uh, clear sky healing clear sky legal uh, it's 0127498 and it's www.cskylegal.co.uk. Ah, brilliant. Thank you very much. I like the fact that you've come in a suit. It was Schwarkmees last time. It was <laughs> like, I'm not going to come in a I, suit. I, just, I literally landed the night before, I think, before we shot the last <laughs> podcast. I yeah. literally just landed. Uh, but this time I thought, I'm going to I'm gonna make an effort. Why not? Purple yeah. tie and everything as well. Purple I mean, tie. Matching what? I, I saw the watch and it's got a yeah. bit of <laughs> red or purple. I'm in taking, I I'm taking some uh, pointers from you colour, now. Colour coordination. And we got a shout out before we end the podcast. Skylight. Um, coffee, uh, five lane ends roundabout. I've been drinking the pistachio. Oh, well, latte I'm gonna go now. I think we're gonna go yes. now. I can't recommend. I want part two. I want another one. <laughs> so nice pistachio latte. Felix set that up. Beautiful business. Definitely recommend going there, checking it out. And uh, yeah, if you like that episode, please like, subscribe, comment, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>